Oh, dig it. Thank you. Wash, wash, wash. I wash. What's the, what's the nearest state? Okay, Mr. President, Simona Nanate. The one in Singapore. You mean with the president? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm not sure. But, but I think definitely the president will go to the US. Right. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Again, welcome to the first meeting of uh, Rotary Year 2022-2023, Imagine Rotary. And to open this first meeting, may we call on our President, palapakan po natin, yeah. President Michael Escaler. I call this meeting to order. Thank you all for coming. Hindi ka daw narinig kasi hybrid tayo sa President Michael. Can you use your mic para marinig tayo? At saka hybrid tayo. We have a hybrid meeting with the online and the one face-to-face -face here. May I call this first meeting to order? Yeah. And welcome to all those who are in the Zoom. Thank you. Okay, to lead us in our prayer, can we call uh, PP David Ackerman? Fellow Rotarians and guests, may I invite everyone to please rise. As the calendar turns and another new Rotary year begins, let us all be thankful for our Rotary friends and the changes our brand of service can bring. We are thankful for those who accept the call to serve. Thank you, Lord, for President Michael, his board members, his officers, and his advisors. We're thankful that today they give their time for us from now until the next June. May their service embolden each other with courage, as they steer our club to great heights. May the past presidents before them offer strength and fine advice. May the RC Makati members, both old and new, appreciate and find time to give to our club we hold dear to our hearts. Let us rise to the challenges given to us by the times. Let us aim to give more to the cause. Let us continue to make the world better, even if no one gives us applause. All these we pray in the Lord's name. Amen. Thank you, President David, uh, PP David. Now we go to the Philippine National Anthem. Please stand.
Please remain. palakpakan talagang na uh, pag first day talagang masaya tayo lahat ano okay and of, of course we're also uh, hopefully starting our new place that were of course asking uh, the comments from our dotarians where they would like to have our new home but uh, hopefully you enjoy our lunch uh, this afternoon uh, here at chef jesse okay so we go to the four way test uh, Is it the truth? Parang mahina, gutom pa kayong lahat, ano? O yung ating mga waiter from Chef Jesse, bilis-bilisan nyo, marami pang gutom. Okay, pero please enjoy the sumptuous lunch. Again, is it the truth? Mas malakas yung yes, ha? Okay, is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? Parang may naubo doon na. Ah. Okay, and last, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Okay, so hopefully we will be guided by those four-way tests. And uh, as we proceed, may I call on uh, PP Tito uh, by uh, his request. Palakpakan naman natin. Actually, this is not in the program today, but uh, I, with the indulgence of the president, which I did not clear this yet. But you know, may I suggest that we revive our fine moments. In the past, for the last, uh, well, since I joined the club, we had fine moments, but for the last 10 years, for lack of people volunteering to become uh, the fine master, uh, this has been dropped somewhat. But you know, I think it's a good time to revive it, especially now that we're reviving face-to-face -face after almost two years or over two years of the pandemic. I will suggest you know, that, uh, that we revive it. And I'm sure we have enough uh, brilliant, funny, witty, uh, potential fine masters here. Uh, in fact, if I may suggest, You know, since the, since the popularity of the internet, the Viber group, and what have you, there are really so many new jokes coming out, funny stuff, funny anecdotes coming out, no, of your uh, of your cell phone. And if I may suggest, if there is a nice, doesn't even have to be funny, but witty anecdote uh, that is. That is forwarded around, shared. You know, keep it in your memory or keep it somewhat. 
And then let's share it during the fine moments. Perhaps we will no longer call it finding moment, but perhaps let's call it fine moments because what you will share is something that I believe could be shared here as a whole. In fact, I know we have a schedule, but I'll just take a minute of your time to share something that has been uh, with me and something, an anecdote that uh, is amusing, and yet it has a timely message. Uh, let me share this with you today. Uh, let me retrieve it. Yeah, it's a, uh, I guess most of us are now being uh, indulged into so much artificial intelligence, AI, all right? Uh, let me share with you a very, uh, I would say, cute, witty anecdote about artificial intelligence. And this is how it goes. It's about a man who orders pizza from Shakey's Pizza. And uh, it says it's no longer he calls. And the man says, uh, I'm ordering pizza from Shakey's Pizza. And uh, the other side of the phone said, sir, this is no longer Shakey's Pizza, but this is Google Pizza. All right, and how does it go? The man orders his favorite uh, pizza, and uh, you want your usual pizza, which is composed of uh, ham, bacon, etc. And says, uh, according, is no good. How in the hell did you know that? We cross-referenced your home phone number with your medical records. We have the results of your blood tests for the last seven years. Well, either way, I don't want your goddamn vegetarian pizza. I take medication for the cholesterol problem. Excuse me, sir, but you have not taken your medication regularly. According to our database, you purchased only a box of 30 tablets once at Superfarm Pharmacy for months ago. I bought more from another pharmacy. That doesn't show on your credit card statement. Well, I paid in cash, that's why. But you did not withdraw enough cash according to your bank statement. Jesus Christ, I have other sources of money. That doesn't show on your latest tax returns unless you bought them using an undeclared income source, which is illegal. What the hell? Somehow you have my tax records? This is nuts! I'm sorry, sir. We use such information only with the sole intention of helping you. I'm sick and tired of Google and Twitter and WhatsApp and all that shit. I'm going to a desert island where I have to deal with any of that shit. I understand, but you need to renew your passport first. It expired six weeks ago. How in the hell did you know about my passport being expired? I was going to renew it. Jesus Christ, what's wrong with our country? Well, welcome to the new world. The new world is here and it's scary. So everyone be ready because that's what's happening. Good evening. Okay, that's just a sample, I think, of a very cute, witty anecdote, but it has a lesson. We're now guided by mostly by artificial intelligence. And so what the guy says is, be careful, uh, watch your steps. <laughs> watch who you text, 
and what watch what kind of text messages you send. Somebody may be listening out there. Anyway, uh, as I said, I'll end there, but I do hope we can continue uh, uh, this thing of the finding moments. Sunny Tambunting Bear gives very nice, Sunny very, has many jokes to share. I'm sure uh, uh, everybody here uh, can be tasked to prepare for our weekly uh, fine moments. Okay, do I have your support? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Mahirap pag si Pipi Tito yung nauna sa akin eh. Baba yung mic. Masyado mataas. Anyway, unahan na natin yung fine moments. Uh, let me find uh, Pipi Tito for 100 pesos for that very nice uh, suggestion. Palakpakan po natin. Oh, pwede na yan, di ba? Unahan na natin ng ano, ano Pipi Tito. Your first joke for Imagine Rotary Year since artificial intelligence. Oh, Pipi Tito. Alam mo to. O minimum daw, 500. Mali. Okay, 500 pesos for PP Tito for that good suggestion. Okay, so ito. PP Tito, pag hindi mo nasagot, another 500. Dahil uh, ito, alam na alam mo, itong joke na ito. Artificial intelligence. So what is an artificial number? Give me an artificial number. 31 million. Palapakan natin. Ayan, oh. Another 500 pesos for PP Tito. Okay. Thank you. Pagpunta niya dito, sabi ni President Mike, dala kayo isang libo. Okay. So, punta naman tayo sa happy birthday. At uh, greetings of birthday and anniversary. Okay, sino bang may birthday? Okay, here? Ayan pala, ayan pala. Wala pala dito. Okay. I think wala ngayon si President Fred. Nasa mala kanyang first, uh, first meeting ata ngayon. So let us uh, send our uh, happy birthday to PP Fred and wedding anniversary to, of course, PP Reggie and Ann Sue. Uh, PP Fred for July 7 and today. Today ba ang anniversary? Anniversary? Uh, uh, 5 July. So ngayon nga yan. PP Reggie and Ann Sue Nulido. So palakpakan po natin. Give them a round of applause. Meron pa ba tayong song? Wala na. Wala na? Wala na. Okay. Ayaw kumanta ni President Louie. Tapos naroon siya kumanta. Okay, so acknowledgements. We are again a hybrid in Zoom and face-to-face. Uh, -face. Okay, we would like to acknowledge the ones present here, Rotary Anne, of course, and Irene Barcelon over there. And um, on Zoom, and Nelly Bengzon, and Yvonne Kwan, and Marilu Alejandro. Uh, let's give them a big hand on Zoom, joining us online. Other guests uh, present today, Winston Uy over there. I saw him a while ago, sir. Uh, our incoming member, our, one of our new members. Also, incoming member, Ronnie Shasoko. Shasoiko. Butch Dicini. Oni Chavez. And Grace Tolentino. Also, we have uh, Rotarian Carmelita Lara Basher from RC Cho Chola Vista. Chola Vista is in uh, California? San Diego, California. Okay. Oldest club in San Diego. So I bet you play a lot of golf. There's a lot of golf places in San Diego. And SeaWorld. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm sure the golfers here would like to visit and play a round or two there once in a while, sometime. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. And on Zoom, PP Megs Loon from RC Metro Calibo, 
PP Rose Reyes from RC Calibo, ALS Interact Club President Sandra De La Cruz also from Zoom, and Chem Alco Aldecoa also from Zoom. Congra uh, welcome our friends from Zoom and online. Okay. So, okay, so we now go to the president's time. I'll uh, give you now President Michael Escalera for his first president time for Rotary Year. Imagine Rotary Year. Thank you very much for your uh, warm welcome. As you know, in the Rotary Club of Makati, nobody asks for the position to become president. But when you are absent enough, they appoint you and you have no chance to object. <laughs> but service about self. Service about self. Yeah. But, but in truth, it's really a privilege and a great uh, distinction. Uh, but also daunting for the simple fact that you are coming after a very active, vibrant, dedicated president like Louis Aceoche. <laughs> I thought, I thought his wife would be happy that he would now be more at home. But yesterday I was in a party of another Rotary Club and he was also there. So I think that his wife will not be very happy very long. I, I, I see, I really see a lot of very distinguished people here. I especially welcome my old friend Winston Oi for joining us. I see a lot of old friends like Fidel, Roland, Cesar, uh, Felix, Wash, Wash, and all of these people who have always been the backbone that has kept this, uh, this club alive, especially Bimbo, Pisa Juju Dayrit. All of these guys are really the one behind the club and uh, they just keep it going. I also want to mention a special guest tonight who I uh, invited because a long time ago, she told me, Michael, if one day you become president of the Rotary Club, I will get out of retirement and support you. There she is, Irene Barcelon. <laughs> okay. Like always, they are true to their word. Thank you, Irene. I'm really honored. And maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm here. So thank you very much. Jun Jun, thank you for all the help you give to make our uh, Rotary induction successful. Sid, for being the guiding light. Nothing in this club happens without Sid's nod. I don't really have much to say as a first speech, but uh, you know, just to thank you everybody for uh, being here, boom. You're always very quiet, but you've always been there. Um, I just have a few announcements and that is that the Manila pen rate rising to a prohibitive level. We're now thinking of rotating venues to the next several weeks until we find the right one that is suitable for us and uh, the food is as delicious as it is today. Uh, again, I must thank PDG Sid and Manny Padiernos for representing our club at the Children's Day at the Rotary Homes compound in Paranaque last week. Uh, PDG Sid is the author of giving homes to the homeless people who live by the river, who every time it rains and floods, they lose their homes. So Sid uh, envisioned that they be given permanent homes and we all support this. And the people who you have helped probably will never be able to thank you enough. Um, we should so soon start the construction of houses in the new Rotary Homes compound. Another guy who may or may not be here, I didn't see him, is um, Eddie Galvez. Oh, there he is, Eddie Galvez. He created uh, dormitories in Mindanao and then soon in uh, Visayas. 
so that people don't have to travel 50 kilometers going to school. So he put the dorms near the school so that they don't have to travel far. And these are achievements, small, but maybe small for us, but big for others. And so the Rotary Club continues to do good in small but big ways. And I'm so proud to be a member of it. I'm so proud for the new members who will be engaged and who will evolve the club to a new direction. The more we learn about each other, the more we will grow. One of the themes that I will tell you is my goal is really to know each other more because all of us are a treasure in their own way. And so my job as president is to get to know you all and to go for each of us to get to know each other more so we can bring out or we can continue to bring out the best in all of us. Many thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you, President Michael. And now to introduce our guest speaker who we already all know, who is a very dear to us. Itong taong to eh, bago introduce ni Comrade, eh, sabihin ko lang si Boss George, eh, nakita ko niya naka-shorts pa lang. Sana hindi nakadaya pera, no, George? <laughs> so... Doon sa hindi nakakaalam, our, our house is just a uh, hollow block away di ba? when we grew up together. But to formally introduce uh, our very distinguished guest speaker who is also very dear to us, let me call our comrade, our very esteemed Rotarian, Rotarian boy, Arteche. Buen dia a todos. Me llamo Señor Boy Arteche. Es gran, gran honor presentar a un buen amigo, Señor George, a friend who everybody knows. George is the president of the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry the largest business organization in the country. He represents the private sector in the Industry Development Council and National Competitive Council. George is also one of the three Philippine representatives to the ASEAN Advisory Council and a private sector representative to the Legislative Executive Development Advisory Council. George is the president of the Integrated Computer System, a pioneer in computer systems and peripherals. An affiliate of ICS is the ICS-ICT Corporation, an IT logistics company that operates out of Clark Special Zone and Zebu. George is the president of Paramount Vinyl Products and Interpolymer Corporation, involved in the manufacture of plastic sheeting and rubber matting. He's also the president of several realty development companies that provide office space, commercial outlets, and warehouse offices for Eagle Zone locators and BPOs. George is the chairman of Philippine Exporters Confederation, a board member of Philippine Business for Education, a director of Cardinal Santos Foundation, and a member esteemed member of Rotary Club of Makati. Hermanos, hermanas, demos la bienvenida a nuestro amigo, Señor George Barcelon. Ven aquí. Thank you, Conrad, attorney boy, for that a very generous introduction. I'd like to first thank our president, Michael Escaler, for inviting me here 
We have this opportunity to address you, my fellow Rotarians and esteemed colleagues and friends. A new set of leaders have officially taken the baton to lead us in the next six years. The overwhelming lead of President Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr. and Vice President Sara Zimmerman Duterte in the main national election dispel all doubts as to the will of the majority. It is now up to us as a nation and as citizens to follow up and follow through as our leaders start taking action to set the path to recovery and economic sustainability. As with any administration, we move forward with guarded optimism and hopefully followed by confidence inspired through a newly elected president that can make an upbeat future for all of us. The headwind that President Marcos Jr. faced are the headlines we read on a daily basis. Russia-Ukraine war, soaring oil and energy prices, supply chain bottlenecks, high inflation, rising debt, and the looming food crisis. But let me remind you that we are in no worse situation as other countries. His economic manager, led by the highly capable finance secretary, Ben Gyokno, assured that we have strong economic fundamentals and that the new government has enough elbow room to manage the challenges. The road ahead, although, will not be easy. The president has carefully selected experts and technocrats as cabinet members, knowing now is not the time for learning, but for those who can hold a steady economic kill to move our country forward. Aside from the appointment of Secretary of Finance, Ben Diogno, we welcome, of course, our esteemed past Rotarian President, Secretary Fred Pascual, at the helm of Department of Trade and Industry. NEDA Secretary R.C. Balisakan and Transport Secretary Jimmy Bautista and PCCI's own ICT Secretary Attorney Ivan Wee. They are all familiar names with experiences and well-established credentials. We welcome, we most welcome President Marcos Jr. personally taking the cudgel as Secretary of Agriculture. This shows us BBM is holding the bull by the horns. Agriculture, hopefully, will be, giving, will be given the long overdue attention. It needs as a sector that is crucial and foundational part of our country's economic transformation. By the mere fact that farming and fishery are the primary and often the only source of livelihood of people living in the rural areas where poverty is prevalent. Any long-term strategic plan for resilient, inclusive, and sustainable economy will anchor on the agricultural sector. This major endeavor will test his leadership and political will to fast track a sector that is political at various government 
local government complexities and the tweaking of the agrarian law. Fundamental reform, if implemented well in the agri sector, will imbue the confidence of its leadership. Bold words were uttered in the inaugural speech, and we hope that they will be followed up with passion and commitment to bring about the dreams. In his speech, he says, ang pangarap ng taong bayan, aspiration of the people of 110 million of our countrymen. PCCI has always been supportive of the country's leadership, whoever and whatever political color he or she may have. Everyone's support will be especially crucial. Not banking on the often talked about the first 100 days when the president and his team shared their plans. Hopefully with a well thought out plan that present the greatest opportunity and leverage on our country's human and natural resources. As with every young presidency, the incumbent takes to office in the glow of enthusiasm and with the pledge of new solution. But what we look for are committed timelines of the president administration to the rest of the six year term to build up the momentum for recovery and growth in catching up with our more progressive ASEAN neighbors, who by the way, are not standing idly by. At his June 30 inaugural address, President Marcos stated that his government is presently drawing up comprehensive, all-inclusive plans for economic transformation, wherein he emphasizes priority, food security, education, health, and public infrastructure, climate change, and energy. PCCI is reaching out to the president. Earlier, when I was seated beside my good friend, Attorney Howie, he said it should be the other way around. But I guess when he sees private sector reaching out, he will reciprocate. We reach out with renewed optimism. Most of his pronouncements are consistent with PCCI's strategic roadmap under the acronym Reach Out Agenda. I will go through this briefly and I will elaborate each letter, letter later on. The first letter in Reach Out stands for R, reinvigorating our natural resource sector. E, second letter, enhancing energy and education. Third letter, A, accelerating agriculture productivity and modernization for food security and inclusive growth. C, commitment on our digital connectivity infrastructure and climate change. The last letter of reach is H, harnessing health and human skills. And the second word out stands for one united in transformation and transparency. During the Duterte administration, we underscored the need to raise our country's competitiveness. We were met with favorable response. The enactment of the game-changing measures such as streamlining and lowering the costs of doing business wherein ARTA plays a key role. Tax reforms, 
lowering taxes, and rationalizing incentives, opening key sectors such as the Retail Trade Liberalization, the Public Service Act, and the Foreign Direct Investment Act. All of this is a gateway for government to attract more investments in our country. Reach Out is intended to leverage on this accomplishment by developing and building on the potentials of our indigenous resources. Let me share with you the detail for each letter. Reinvigorating our natural resources. Mining has the highest potential for growth. If government only resolves to address the uncertainty surrounding the fiscal regime in mining and have the political will to address local government and civil groups intervention in mining projects, our country is estimated to have $1.4 trillion in mining reserves. And mining potential has been ranked the fifth largest in the world, covering an estimated 9 million hectares. However, as of now, less than 2% of these reserve areas have mining permits, so that even, the country, even though the country has reached mineral, reserves, export of mineral products comprise only of 8.5% of all minerals exported from the ASEAN six economies. Finding a balance between a stable economy and healthy environment is an important component of making full use of our mineral resources. Most large mining firms practice responsible global mining standards and doing extensive rehabilitation programs. This should be made mandatory to all mining and mineral exploration activities, including those of the small mines allowed by local governments. Another resource base that has high potential for our country is forestry. Forestry is not only important to combat climate change, but its sustainable use could revive our ailing wood furniture industry, wherein our country was once a leader in Asia. I'd like to touch on in particular bamboo. There are more than 60 species of bamboo known in the world and they have, they're being grown in our country. 20 of them are uniquely ours and grown nowhere else. To put that in, into perspective, we have almost 16 million hectares of 53% of land that can be used for planting bamboos. The remaining forests comprise of 5 point million hectares or 19% of our total land area. So as you can see, with proper planning, this resource can generate jobs and income for the country. Another resource that is often overlooked, salt harvesting. We have about 33, 36,000 kilometers of coastline, which makes our country the fifth longest coastline in the world. Yet we import 80% of our salt for industrial use. E, enhancing energy and education. Energy, of course, fuel, power, electricity and education are both major engines, the lifeline of economic growth in the country. They are two key elements that we need to revamp our economy. 
On the matter of energy and power, Malampaya, which is our country's only indigenous source of liquefied natural gas, continues to exhaust. The gas field is expected to run dry by 2027. Meanwhile, the price of oil and its impact on power rates are pushing inflation upward. We should be more aggressive in exploring our resources in oil, LNG. Malaysia and Indonesia lead in oil and gas exploration in our region, followed by Vietnam and Thailand, while we are last. Our neighbor countries, neighboring countries were able to develop domestic fuel res resources by drilling more wells. We can follow, attract investments, expedite petroleum and LNG exploration. Of course, there is now a focus on renewable energy. We are urging government to consider that those that have hired proven and acknowledged technology that requires no subsidy from either government or the consumer to meet reasonable cost of to the consumer and can deliver quality, reliable supply to the industry. Geothermal comes to mind. The total capacity of geothermal energy in the Philippines is almost 2,000 megawatts. And this was consistent for the last four years. Energy Development Corporation, better known as EDC, expect to complete two geothermal projects by this year. One with a 3.6 megawatt in Mindanao, and another one 39 megawatt Bachman plants in the Philippines. What we are lacking is the grid connectivity to link them from the south to the north. So we hope the new administration will address this issue and invest on the grid that would link the energy source to Northern Luzon or Southern Luzon. Last week, we had a dialogue with the Department of Energy, the Energy Regulatory Commission or ERC, and the Retail Electricity Suppliers Association, better known as RESA, on the concern of companies that are directly buying their electricity from retail suppliers. Concern is high on the perceived scarcity of resource that may negatively impact our industries. And again, during our, my discussion earlier with some more Rotarians, energy available and cost of energy is top of mind in many of our investors that are looking into the Philippines. The other E I refer to is regarding education. With respect to education, the transition to digital system and processes accelerated rapidly under the COVID-19. Although the digital gap between the economic class is of great concern, the aspect, this aspect makes upskilling and reskilling of workers crucial to respond to changing business needs. The ASEAN investment report says post-pandemic investment in the digital economy and technology-related infrastructure will be key driver to FDIs and consequently economic growth. We should be able to leverage on our young, technologically proficient workforce by equipping them with high-value skills, specifically on digital literacy. I'd just like to share with you the experience of one of my friends, one of our vice president of BCCI. His name is Perry Ferrer. He operates a big uh, electronic assembling company, EMC. And to my surprise, he's now operating five Japanese factories in Japan. He trained their engineers here, 
learn to speak a bit of Japanese, and then send lock, stock, and barrel the engineers, the workers, and management. And he's up to his neck, people coming to him, hoping that they can run their factories. Well, the reason why in Japan, because the population of Japan is aging. And a lot of them are, are uh, you know, over age and not productive anymore. And not only Japan, by the way, he has already contracted factories in Australia. And he's targeting a factory in Hungary. So all of this really refers to the upskilling of our young men and women. When the potential is not only here, before we used to think of OFW as health caretaker and the likes. But now, if you're skilled enough, there are opportunities out there for our highly trained engineers to work abroad. And on the side, he said, you know, George is quite lucrative. I hired them for about two to 3,000 Aussie dollars. I charge them $5,000. <laughs> so you can imagine. Earlier, I talked about the uh, importance of connectivity, in particular broadband. In our country, we need to make it affordable and available of broadband to the underserved areas that have brought to light the government needs to prod the telco players to deliver such basic IT necessity. Just to share with you, the international yardstick of affordability of reasonable upload and download speed, which is 25 megabits per second should be, should cost a family two to 3% of their family monthly income. So if you were to compute based on what the family earn now, let's say a 30,000, okay? So ideally it should cost between 600 to 700 pesos a month. It begs the question, if other countries can do it, why can't we? Uh, I'm sure many of you are fami is familiar with uh, the company called Converts, the, uh, the other Dennis Week, right? the one that's, he's also a member of our chamber, PCCI. He's the, chamber, he's the chairman of our digital innovation. And of course he has rolled out fiber optics throughout the Philippines. So, I mentioned this to him and he said, you know, it's really a big challenge. Recently, he was given an incentive by BOI, a nine year incentive for the money he put in, in the uh, fiber optics. And I told him, I said, Dennis, you should use that money to support the underserved or unserved areas because that is, that is where I think will make a difference to the marginalized. Okay? I, 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 over the past year and a half, I feel bad because a lot of poor families, they have to, the children have to study from home. And you, and you can imagine the speed of our internet. It's horrible, diba? Right? So this is something that, uh, that uh, we have, uh, we are continuing this partnership. I will just touch on the, uh, uh, what we do. Uh, we also have, uh, we partner with Huawei uh, to touch on and familiarize the importance of artificial intelligence that was uh, shared with us earlier by uh, Tito, that uh, how artificial intelligence can run our life for the better or, or worst. <laughs> and we also have a partnership with the Development Academy of the Philippines for the provision of scholarship to our members on short courses in data science and analytics. 
That is, to, that is for them to enable to see the importance of data security, cyber threat to the business environment. Our involvement as far as uh, both education and technical skill is our collaboration with TESTA. We have jointly developed curriculum to ensure the skills of our graduate meets the industry needs. Next, after C comes no, no, after E comes A, accelerating agriculture productivity and monetization. The farming and fishery sectors remain crucial source of livelihood for the poor and the primary source of Philippine household. These sectors are vital role in inclusive growth, transforming agriculture into a dynamic high growth sector, essential to speed up recovery and poverty reduction. I had the opportunity of touching base with the ambassador of Israel, Ambassador Flush. And uh, it's an ongoing uh, training that the Israel provided us for Filipinos. And uh, this is where that uh, we're not putting some of the graduates to use. Uh, I, I would think the more progressive uh, uh, people in farming, like my good friend Winston Wee, he's in tobacco. And I've heard that his business is progressing because he's using technology. And uh, in, in Israel, what I learned from, uh, from some of the experts is that they recycle 90% to 95% of water. Water in Israel, you know, in that area, it's all desert. It's a very costly commodity. So they recycle 90 to 95%. They call it targeted irrigation and targeted fertigation, even fertilizers. So this is an area wherein I, I, I believe, I hope that uh, uh, President BBM would be able to attract young people to agriculture. Because in the past, you know, agriculture to us, just by the song alone. What's the name? Hindi biro, Planting is hard. But nowadays with high technology, internet of things, okay, drone, I think young people will be attracted to go into farming. And, uh, and this is where I, I, I hope that uh, our reaching out to BBM would be, would get the response that we can help. We have more visibility on the ground. The connectivity that I mentioned earlier, the unhampered flow of goods, people, service, and capital is all anchored on the availability of connectivity. Even our tourism business, and I have sound this off to the previous uh, Secretary of uh, Tourism and the Secretary of uh, the ICT. We all travel as tourists all over the world. And we know that when we're outside, we're connected to our home and our business because of the availability of broadband. Okay? But here, in many areas, we cannot have that. You go to far flung area, and there's no broadband. So even, connect, even connectivity, even broadband is very fundamental for us to develop our tourist business. This is where uh, in the past six years, great strides have been achieved in achieving the infrastructure gap of our countries because of the Build, Build, Build program of Duterte administration that has somehow accelerated many of the roads, railroads, seaport, and airport. However, our country is still 
in the catch-up mode as far as the IT infrastructure is concerned. And I have touched base with the DICT Secretary Ivan Wee that he should suggest to Congress a fixed percentage like the build, build, build of infrastructure. It was it stipulated the 5% of our, of our uh, GAA General Appropriation Act is budgeted for the build, build, build. So IT, I think, should also get a certain percentage for it to expand. Two weeks ago, we, we heard from, from then the incoming DICT Secretary Ivan Wee during PCCI testimonial dinner. And he shared with us his plan to capture investment in broadband and digital infrastructure. He shares the view of institutionalizing digitalization in innovation as national strategies. And this can only be done by fast tracking our nationwide internet connectivity through the completion of our national broadband backbone. Uh, in the past, we are uh, resigned to the fact that uh, there are only two players. And uh, sometimes I look at it, you beggars cannot be choosers. Okay? What they give you, you the subliminal message you read between the lines. So with that, thank you very much for patiently listening to my short talk. Maraming salamat po. Mabuhay tayo lahat. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, very inspirational and very enlightening. Pero siguro nakalimutan ni George yung ano eh. Meron tatlong department, wala pang sekretary. 
on his speech, no? DOH. So maybe pwedeng katukin natin si Rotarian Andrew, si Dr. Andrew, nandyan pa. Oh. Di ba? Palakpak mo naman si Dr. Andrew. <coughs> maybe we can reach out to the President, di ba? Oh. Harley, DNR, di ba? Oh. Para yung Palawa, may representative, di ba? O sa Bimbo, sa Customs. Okay. And of course, let's not forget, sabi nga, energy. Di ba? Let's not forget Cesar for, her, for solar energy. Oh, so palagpakan natin. Di ba? So, you know, uh, Rotary Makati has a very deep bench. No? And uh, if he wants to reach out, I don't think Eddie Galvez or Titi Panlilio will mind Rotary inviting President Marcos to be our speaker sometime soon. Diba? <laughs> oh, palakpakan nyo. Mabala mo nang palakpakan. <laughs> oh, sige, sama na rin ako doon. I also won't mind. <laughs> okay, so to give his, uh, to give a short open forum pala. We can, uh, response na, wala na open forum. Questions, questions. So, some questions. Ayan, oh. Secretary Cesar from the Department of Energy. <laughs> Hello, Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. I'd like to mention that uh, there is a law now that says that building owners should have renewable energy so that the uh, oil importation for power generation can be reduced. So for all of us, a uh, solar panel will be contributing to the power lack of the country. The other statement I'd like to mention is that I was responsible in the modernization of PLDT. And I am sorry to say that it is extremely difficult to provide services to the underserved community. It's too expensive. So when my turn for the expansion, we have to go to bigger places to make money. Otherwise, we will lose money. And today, in spite of the government push, we need 60,000 towers to be established to the underserved country. And uh, right now, we are probably about 20,000 towers. But can you imagine 60,000 towers to be established to provide services in the underserved the other solution that should probably come in is the uh, use of satellite, low orbiting site satellite that Tesla is trying to do. So with that orbiting tower or, or satellite, we will cover all of that, but it is still to come. So people com complain on underserved places because it's too expensive to put. And also, many of us don't realize it is the government that made the telephone system poor, not PLDT. Why? For a long time, President Marcos has kept the rates at very low rates, 500 pesos. So when you have to expand, and I was responsible in expanding the, the modernization, it cost 2,500 US dollars for one telephone, 200. Today, because of the landline that you have to do, 2,500 pesos, dollars to put. So you can imagine that even Dennis will have a problem 
on, on, on putting this. He needs a lot of money and uh, that will not be feasible to service the underserved places in the mountains until you have more telephone lines. So our uh, best technology will come in with the satellite. Thank you. Thank you, Cesar. Any comment, uh, George? Uh, PCCI has actually uh, made a POC proof of concept with Starlink, the low or or orbital thing. And uh, we've been successful. And uh, the lowest pass were in the private sector can have access you know, to, uh, to this uh, satellite uh, links. Uh, but the cost is still very prohibitive. It's still quite high. Uh, there are certain areas wherein uh, if there is enough economic activities for them to justify, they can do it. Okay? Uh, one area that um, we have been requesting government to tweak the law is that in the province, there are a lot of cable service provider, you know, but hanggang ano lang, entertainment, they cannot shift to the digital. And again, this requires the law, and I, we're pushing for it, because there are a lot of small players, you know, they have already the infrastructure, uh, the cable link, of course, these are coaxial, uh, but some of them have shifted to fiber optics. So some laws needs to be tweaked so that uh, they can leverage on, 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 their, on their infrastructure setup. So we look forward that, uh, as I said, that uh, the uh, DICT um, also, uh, also our friend, Secretary Fred Pascual, and also Ben Hur of the Secretary of Local Government. Uh, we have touch base uh, to discuss, uh, you know, about how the digital can help you know, in the local government and, and, and also uh, with uh, DTI. Uh, if you notice the statement that was released by uh, Fred Pascual the other day about the three uh, areas that he would like to touch on, which is uh, basically anchored towards uh, uh, digitalization. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Junjun, PP Junjun. George, uh, you're the president of the PCCI, so I have a two-part question. The first question is, what percentage of the agriculture industry in the Philippines is represented by PCCI? Actually, the farmers group, the Alianza, you know, uh, agree. They're very, very active. But we have we we have a committee wherein we get them to to to, to join the PCCI. We have like the biggest exporter of banana and uh, pineapple. Some of you may know him, uh, Paul Kuya King. He's one of the biggest. We have people in the uh, in the uh, Mr. Ordonez, Ernie Ordonez. Uh, he's has been in the he's used to be a USEC for agriculture, and uh, he's quite involved. Of course, you know, late as of late, one of the issue of the country not ratifying the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Program, is because of the back noises that's created by the agricultural sectors. They feel that once we open the floodgate. They're going to lose out, which is one of the issues now that's being addressed about uh, smuggling. Okay. So percentage-wise, members-wise, not that many. But affiliate, many of the big organizations are all part of PCCI. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that uh, PCCI is reaching out to the government. Right. So <clears throat> what is the agenda that you're presenting to the government as far as agriculture is concerned? Well, if uh, just on that acronym alone, uh, when I went through its letter, 
we're touching almost every facet of, uh, of what the industry needs. Power, human skill, education, you know, how to, how should we, how should the country, you know, really leverage on a resource base uh, sectors. And, and all of this, I think would help. The bottom, the bottom line is really to create more jobs. Uh, you know, every year we have added to the workforce. Of course, the last two years because of the COVID pandemic, uh, there, there was a blip. Uh, yung mga estudyante, hindi natapos yung K-12. But every year we add about 700,000 to 800,000 to the workforce. The industry absorptive capacity is not enough. We can take in only about 150 to 200,000. And, and that is where that, uh, as I was uh, sharing my thoughts with uh, Secretary Pasqual, we need really to target foreign direct investments that can provide jobs, high level jobs. We need to target uh, certain industry, not only for them to come, but we need to incentivize the training, the upskilling. You know, some of these high tech uh, companies, their equipments are not cheap. You know, if they come here, a lot of times we talk about skills mismatch. Actually, there's hardly any matching going on. The, the earlier I mentioned about TESDA, TESDA is basically focused on the low tech sector. But we have, uh, we have people in the uh, IT, uh, machine tooling, setting up with TESDA some program, which is really what we really want. We, we want to go up the value chain. We don't want people to come in just to hire our, our Filipinos at minimum wage. Sayang namin yung talent natin. So this is this training that, um, that we hope that the uh, DTI and DOLE will, will work together with private sector. I, I hope I answer your question on, on, on that, that side of the skills that's needed for the country. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, Hardy, uh, is there anybody to follow Hardy? Good morning, Caroline. everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I was inspired by uh, George Barcelona on your uh, uh, messages, on your, uh, yeah, on your messages. That, that's why I am looking at on the uh, power generation on the countryside, uh, because we have a uh, power generation that is agri-based, and uh, these are uh, embedded modular power generators that can be embedded in every LGU or in every uh, cooperative. Because according to the law, there is now a law. Actually, I think that law was done uh, this uh, term of uh, President Duterte that every LGU should have at least five to 10 megawatt power. They are already mandated to put up their own generating facility. And on the other hand, also on the electric cooperative, they're also mandated to put up that power generating facility. Now, actually we started this already, though according to the speeches that you have, that, um, that is the priority now. One of the priorities of President uh, Marcos is to uh, enhance and uh, even um, magnify this kind of power generation. That's why we have this in Palawan. Actually in Palawan, uh, just to uh, give you the predicate on this, that uh, we started to uh, federate the cooperatives. There were about 14 cooperatives and we were able to federate that into one because I am looking at a uh, corporative approach. In other words, a corporation and a cooperative. So that the cooperative will uh, have really a good, uh, in terms of um, income generation, and then converting the uh, oil pump to power generation. Because in Indonesia, which uh, I am the representative of a state-owned company, PTP Pipercero, uh, they are asking me or they are telling me to use this also, to replicate this uh, technology in the Philippines. Because precisely if we will do that, at least if everything is, uh, is there or in place, in six to eight months, it will be operational. In other words, if we look at now the uh, LGU, there are around uh, 1,500 LGU nationwide. If we can only embed 10 megawatt each, 
that is around 11,500 megawatts, which is enough of our requirement because right now we have almost 28,000 megawatts. But if you will look into the industry, so that we will have a vibrant industry, we should have at least 35,000 megawatt of power. And precisely right now, we are only rationing our power generation. That's why a lot of brownout in the countryside are happening. Like for example, in Palawan. Palawan is considered as the brownout capital of the Philippines. <laughs> You can, you can just, I sorry, you can just imagine brown out capital of the Philippines. It's a tourist spot. Everybody wants to go to El Nido, to Coron. But you see, I experienced that in a day, at least three times brown out. You can just imagine. That's why the uh, cooperatives there, these are 14 cooperatives. We were able to uh, negotiate, of course, uh, with the help of CDA, Cooperative Development Authority. Because right now, there are about, 10, I think, 25,000 cooperatives nationwide. So if only we can federate some of them to engage in power generation. Therefore, we can uh, um, have a consortium with the local, local government, because under the law, the LGU is now mandated to put up its own generating facility. There is now an RA. Well, well, in answer to that, I think uh, uh, we have now the Mandana's law, okay. where in the national uh, has a portion, uh, almost 20% of our general appropriation okay. fund okay. to the local government. It amounts to almost uh, 980 billion pesos. And these are some of the things that maybe the local government can take up. But you know, when the feedstock is agri-based, yeah. okay, uh, there is also volatility. Okay. You remember one time we're in the uh, Department of Transportation uh, required the gasoline to add ethanol. And after a while, you know, when the ethanol price goes up because it's, it's subject to the international fluctuation, it's hard to maintain. Well, I can, I guess uh, our president, uh, Michael Escalera, has some insights in the sugar refinery where they can use bagas, you know, to, the, to, to generate power. A lot of agri-based things, uh, their cost is also in the logistic, the collection of all of this feedstock, and that costs money. So if it's viable, I'm sure many of the local governments can see the, you know, with the money that they're getting from the Mandana's uh, ruling, they will invest uh, in, uh, in this. Uh, in, in, in Bacolot, um, what Mayor Albi invested in the solar panel, okay? Uh, but one of the shortcomings of the solar energy is that uh, it's not 24 hours, okay? So, yeah, yeah. You know very well. And, and this is where now he, he said that uh, he's asking Huawei to help them in the battery backup. So, yeah. that just, I mean, that's the whole cycle of it. You need, you have the solar panel, but you need the backup also on the batteries. Yeah, actually, uh, for the solar panel, we can do a hybrid cogeneration because there is already that uh, memorandum or uh, circular coming from DOE that there should be a hybridization of solar and of course, they're using now uh, diesel, but instead of using diesel, we can use the palm oil or even to the coconut oil. Actually, there is a study now in Indonesia oil. And the good thing here in the palm oil industry, in three years, by the time you planted that, it can already, there, can, there will be already a fruition. In other words, you can use that already. Now, looking at the whole Philippine archipelago, according to the survey of BNR, there is around uh, only 1% of the 100% forest, forested area. In other words, the, we have so many uh, areas that we can plant off on this. In other words, uh, for example, if we will start in Palawan, of course, in Mindanao also, there are so many plantations there, which I think even uh, uh, Governor... Uh, 
um, barbers is talking to me. Their province, because there are so many indigenous people there, like Lumads, which we can also help that by way of converting the uh, crude palm oil into power generation. We're still waiting for who's going to be appointed as Secretary of Energy, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. And definitely, uh, what you shared with me, if I had a chance to talk to, I'll cascade this to uh, the proper authority for them to really seriously look into this. Okay? Using uh, lastly, yeah. yeah, lastly, I have another, another, another. Uh, lastly, is we are also uh, espousing a uh, barter trade because uh, I think uh, that was. Uh, Three weeks ago, I talked to the ambassador of Indonesia, Ambassador Rijojo, and of course the trade attaché. And uh, they told me uh, that uh, for us to be able to get a lower price in terms of the coal requirement of the country, we can do a barter trade. Now I asked them if what should we have to barter with. Now they told me we can barter on abaca fibers and tobacco. Because actually, there, there is a problem in Southern Philippines now. They told me that there is a big smuggling operations there of coal. Yeah. Yeah. You can just imagine the uh, total requirement of the country to generate a 60% uh, of the 28,000 megawatt of power. Cool. We need almost 100 million metric ton of coal. And Semerara is only supplying us around 20 million tons. So 80 million is, you know, should be used. But question is, last time uh, Secretary uh, Alcusi declared that only 30 million are being imported on record. But of the record, it's 80 million. Where is down the 50 million tons? So that's why this, uh, this uh, barter trade can actually arrest yeah. the problem yeah. of, yeah. yeah. The, the, on the matter of coal, you remember January, Indonesia temporarily uh, limit the export of coal okay and of course we in the ASEAN we we talk to our partners in the ASEAN and then we said uh you know it's very drastic it was very sudden and this is how we do back channeling so talking to them and finally said well the government uh changed the uh, export ban okay uh, but again um you know all of this will fall in the lap of the new secretary of energy and and uh, definitely uh, we are well aware of uh some of this issue and I uh, will just escalate it to the new secretary. Okay, thank you. Okay, so last two questions. Alam natin now we are running out of time, but short questions That's short from question. our guest, uh, yeah, Tony Chavez. Yeah, I'll keep this one short. I uh, want to thank everyone here for allowing us to, uh, to be here today. Oh, I appreciate your uh, hospitality uh, for welcoming us uh, as your guests. Uh, and my question to you, George, uh, well, I'm happy to know that you're, you're into the technology. Um, are you guys involved in cryptocurrency at all, or if there's any uh, participation in that? Um, because that might be something that might be interesting uh, for for funding projects and uh, using it as a part of our economic system? Well, well, it's something that uh, uh, it's talked about, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, 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 we have uh, one of our members who's not with us, is quite active in this, uh, Mr. Concepcion. Toffee, Toffee, yeah, he's not here, but uh, he's quite, well versed on the cryptocurrency and uh, again based on my limited knowledge uh, th there is really potential there's upside but uh, recently the uh, interpol is just looking for a lady who has a scam on the bitcoin to the tune of four billion dollars okay so this is where there's some gray area on the bitcoin uh it's it's not it's not regulated like the banking system right and then uh it's uh it's uh i remember one statement made by jack ma okay with his uh resources of information 
He said, Bitcoin, I'll wait it out and see. <laughs> I'll wait it out and see. Okay, so but that, that's also my sentiment on, on the Bitcoin issue. Okay, so. Well, well uh, a blockchain basically is the thing that, uh, that keeps everything together. I mean, blockchain is the, uh, the uh, you might say, the, the, the bookkeeper on, on the whole, you know, Bitcoin thing. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's being used. Uh, I have attended a couple of seminars on this uh, Bitcoin, and we had uh, invited the speakers for PCCI. So it's it's good to know, and uh, let's see how this takes off in the future. Okay, thank you, Tony. Julian, our last uh, question, then we can go to the last response question here, yeah, George. Uh, we all appreciate the initiatives of PCCI, as uh, you enumerated in your reach out program. But I think all of these aspirations would be a lot more useful to all of us, including government if you could focus more on specific objectives and quantify those objectives and have the corresponding cabinet members buy into it. Uh, Korea, I was told, uh, progressed very quickly because the private sector and the government reported together to President Park at the time, you know. And walang turuan. If you fail, you both fail. Okay. So if you succeed, you it's because of government and private sector working together. So I I hope that PCCI can get to that stage. Okay. Thank you. Well, basically, as I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes we're we're too hang up on the hundred days. But I, what I mentioned was that we, the government really needs to roll, roll out, okay, some of the projects with timetable. Okay, I mentioned earlier about the connectivity issue, where they should really allocate more funds, uh, as what uh, our good friend here says has mentioned. We need sixty thousand towers. You know, as of as of now, Vietnam has about a hundred thousand towers smaller country see so we really that's why i said uh, we really have to catch up the other countries are not uh, standing idly they're advancing you know when i meet them in the uh, asean back and i see what they have in the blueprint and but we are also know uh, then we know that we have a lot of catch up on on that issue definitely uh, the timeline thing is uh, one of our objective to prod the government uh, that they they will roll out project, but they must have a timeline. Okay. I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, George. I give uh, George a, a round of applause again for a very good uh, inaugural first speaker and first open forum. And the president of PCCI, paano papag president of the Philippines? Makabuong araw na tayo dito. <laughs> So to give his uh, response, President Mike. Uh, thank you, George, for such a very enlightening speech. I feel that you that this is only going to be one of a series of talks that you will give us. We certainly have a lot of problems, but I think it is good uh, as uh, Jolion uh, mentioned that we could prioritize our problems maybe to five and get government and private sector to join together to give monthly reports to the president where they're going and what they have done. So you, you, your, your talk today was extremely enlightening and we have a long way to go to catch up with our neighbors. But uh, in the Rotary Club, we never give up. And uh, for all the contribution, and thank you for the guests, for all your interest and wise questions. Thank you for attending. I'd like to give 
this uh, bottle of wine to George so he can think about our solutions while he's drinking a good bottle of wine. Thank you. Okay, thank you, President Mike. And um, President Mike, you're not yet done. You have to adjourn the meeting, to adjourn the meeting. Again, thank you, thank you for everybody. Um, your comments would be appreciated. As already mentioned a while ago, we will be going around to test uh, where our home will be. So. If you have any comments for this afternoon's lunch, uh, please uh, send it to us immediately. Thank you to all. I would like to you about the 11.